What's going guys, today we'll go over practice test number 5, section 3 from the official College Board exams. As always, we'll quickly go over the easy questions and get more in depth on the harder questions. So, let's get straight into it. What's up guys, John from Admission Hackers, quick announcement before we start. You're about to see one of the fastest ways to solve these SAT questions. And I have created a 6 week program that will train you to solve them the exact same way. Everything is in the video format, so it's easier to follow than your SAT prep books, and the program only covers what's proven to be tested on the SAT to not waste your time and raise your score quickly. Also, I'll be mentoring you personally until you get your target score, but more details in the description box down below. That's it, let's get to the video. Number one, which of the following is an equation of a line L in the XY plane above? Well, line L has a y-intercept at positive one, and the only choice that has that is going to be choice D, so D will be your answer. Number two, the circle above with center O has a circumference of 36. What is the length of the minor arc AC? So arc AC has a angle of 90 degrees, which means this portion right here will be a quarter of the whole circle. And the circle as a whole has a circumference of 36, which means this arc length will be just one fourth of it, which will be just 36 over four, nine. Answer is going to be choice A. Number three, what are the solutions of the quadratic equation right here? Well, we're going to have to factor, but before we do that, let's factor out the four first. It's going to be four parentheses x squared minus two x minus three is equal to zero. And this can be factored into x minus three, x plus one, which means our roots are going to be three or minus one. And the only choice that says that is going to be choice B. B will be your answer. Number four, which of the following is an example of a function whose graph in the xy plane has no x-intercept, right? So linear function whose rate of change is not zero, which means our slope is going to be not equal to zero, so it could possibly be like one. So example of that would be y equals x, and graphically it would look something like this, and it crosses the x-axis right there, which means it has the x-intercept. So choice A is going to be out. Choice B, a quadratic function with real zeros. So zeros are referring to the x-intercepts, so if they have real zeros, that means it has x-intercept. So choice B is going to be out. Choice C, a quadratic function with no real zeros, meaning no x-intercept. So choice C will be the answer. Choice D, a cubic polynomial with at least one zero. A cubic function would look something like that, and it would always have at least one x-intercept, so choice D is out as well. Number four, in the equation above, k is a constant. If x equals to nine, what is the value of k? So we just plug it in. Square root of k plus two minus nine is equal to zero. Move it to the other side. k plus two is equal to nine. Square both sides. k plus two is equal to 81. Subtract two. We get that k is equal to 79. Answer is going to be choice D. Number six, which of the following is equivalent to the sum of the expression of this plus that. So it's essentially like, like that. So plus one, minus one, they're gonna cancel each other out. Answer is going to be a squared plus a, which is just choice a. Number seven, Jackie has two summer jobs. She works as a tutor for $12 per hour. So it's going to be tutor is going to be $12 per hour. And she also works as a lifeguard, which pays $9.50 per hour. So lifeguard will be $9.50 per hour. She can work no more than 20 hours per week, but she wants to earn at least $220 per week. So her total time has to be less than or equal to 20, but she wants her money to be at least $220. So which of the following system of inequalities represent the situation in terms of X and Y, where X is the number of hours she tutors and Y is the number of hours she works as a lifeguard? Well, we know that the total hours has to be less than 20 and hours are represented by X and Y. So she, we will just write it as X plus Y has to be less than or equal to 20. And from that choice A will be out, choice B, C, choice D will be out. And in terms of money, let's look at how much she makes. X represents what? The total number of hours that she tutors. So the money from tutor will be just 12X and money from lifeguarding will be just 9.5Y. And if you add them up, it's going to be 12X plus 9.5Y and we want this money to be greater than or equal to how much? 220, which means our answer is going to be choice C because it's greater than. So choice B is out. Number eight, in air, the speed of sound S in meters per second is a linear function of the temperature T in degrees Celsius. And it's given by this function right there, where your S is going to be the Y value and your T is going to be the X value. Which of the following statements is the best interpretation of the 331.4, which is represented right there. So let's graph this real quick. So on the y-axis, we're going to have what? We're going to have the speed. And on the x-axis, we're going to have temperature. And the equation has a positive slope with the y-intercept at 331.4, so 331.4, and it has a positive slope. So it probably looks something like that. And as we know, 331.4 is going to be your y-intercept, which is referring to the y-value when your x is equal to zero. So when your x is equal to zero, that means your temperature is zero. 
and the y value is referring to the speed. So your y-intercept is essentially the speed when your temperature is zero. So 331.4 is going to be the speed when temperature is equal to zero. And the only choice that says that is going to be choice A. Let's go to number nine. If xy is a solution of the systems of equations above right here, when x is greater than zero, what's the value of xy, right? So all we have to do is find x, find y, multiply them together, and that will be our answer. So let's find x and y by using substitution right there. It's going to be two times x squared, which will be two x squared plus six is equal to distributed two x plus six. Subtract six, subtract six, go away. You're left with two x squared is equal to two x, divide by two, divide by two, divide by x, divide by x. We get that x is equal to one. And to find y, we just plug it to this equation right there. So one square is going to be y, which means it's just going to be one as well, which means our answer is going to be choice A. So number 10, if a squared plus b squared is z and ab is equal to y, which the following is equal to that. So let's apply it. Four times z, which will be four a squared plus four b squared plus a times y, eight ab, which would look something like four a squared plus eight ab plus four b squared. If you can factor this, that's completely fine, but here's another way to do it. We need our first term to be 4a squared and the last term to be 4b squared. And the only choice that does that is going to be choice B. Here's why. If you expand this out, you're gonna get 2a plus b and 2a plus 2b. And if you expand it out, it's gonna be 4a squared plus 2ab plus 2ab plus 4b squared, which simplifies to 4a squared plus 4ab plus 4b square. So what you can start to recognize is that, okay, this term times this term is equal to this term right there. And this term times this term is equal to this term right there, which means the first term is going to be first number squared. And the second term is going to be second number squared. And when you know that you can just look at these choices and see which one could possibly be the answer. For example, when you look at choice A, we know that our first term is going to be a squared, which will be just a squared. And the third term will be just two B squared, which will be just four B squared, which doesn't work out. And if you look at choice C, the first term is going to be 4a squared, which will be 16a squared. And the third term will be 8b squared, which will be 64b squared, which doesn't work either. The only one that works is going to be choice B, and that's how you can quickly get it. Make sure you understand this because it's going to come in handy in the future. Let's go to number 11. The volume of a right circular cylinder A is going to be 22 cubic centimeters. What's the volume in cubic centimeters of a right circular cylinder with twice the radius and half of the height of the cylinder A. So we know the volume is going to be pi r squared h, right? And the original volume is going to be 22 right now. And for the new volume, we know that they're going to double the radius. So their equation would look something like 2r squared because they're doubling the radius and half the height, which means it's going to be one half the height. And we're trying to find out what the new volume is. Well, let's rearrange this, which would be pi 4r squared times one half h, right? And we know that, okay, pi r squared h, that's from the original equation. So let's separate that from all the other numbers, which will give us four times one half, which will be two times pi r squared h, that will be our new volume. And we know that, okay, pi r squared h, that's going to be the original volume, we just plug it in, it'll be 22. So our new volume is going to be two times 22, which is 44, answer is going to be choice C. So number 12, which the following is equivalent to nine to the three fourth. And when you look at the answer choices, seems like a typical convert exponent into radical question. So let's try it. So it's going to be nine on the inside, four on the outside, and three on the inside. And if you look at the answer choices, none of them look like that. So choice A is out, choice B is out. So what are we supposed to do here? Well, if you look at the answer choices, C and D, we see that we have three on the inside. But because we have a nine here, we have to put nine inside the radicals. Maybe we have to put three inside the radical. So let's change our equation a little bit. Nine to the three fourth is just same thing as three to the second to the three fourth because three squared is nine, interchangeable. And when we have exponent exponent, we just multiply it, which becomes three to the three over two, which becomes square root of three to the third power, which can be simplified to three square root three. Answer is going to be choice D. Before we move on, here's a quick tip. Let's say you're doing the math and you are stuck on middle of nowhere like that. What you can do is you can look at the answer choices and try to see where you need to go next that will often lead you to the right direction and get you to the correct answer. So keep that in mind. Number 13, at a restaurant, n cups of tea are made by adding tea tea bags to the hot water. And if your equation is t is equal to n plus two, 
how many additional bags are needed to make each additional cup, right? So if we rewrite our equation, we know that T is referring to the bag. Number of bags is equal to number of cups plus two. And to find the relationship, we're gonna plug in a couple of numbers and come up with a couple of data points. So let's say we need one cup of tea. That means we're going to need three bags of tea bags. And if you want two cups of teas, you're gonna need four tea bags. So we see that for every additional cup of tea, we need one additional tea bag, which means our answer is going to be choice B. Number 14, so the function f is shown above right here, and we're trying to find out which of the following is equal to y equals negative f of x. So we have this graph, and we're trying to find out which one represent negative f of x. And how we're gonna do that is by converting this equation right here into negative f of x, and plot a couple points, and see which graph goes along with those points. So let's try that. Negative f of x is the same thing as negative of f of x, which is two to the x plus one. And from here, we can come up with a couple data points. So x, y, when x is equal to zero, your y should be two to zero, one is going to be negative two. And when your x is equal to one, the inside will be three and it will be minus three, right? So the graph of f of x has these two points right here. And the correct graph will also have these two points. So let's check, zero and minus two. Zero, minus two, nothing there, choice A is out. Graph two, zero, minus one, it doesn't, it's not minus two, B is out as well. And zero, minus one, two, C could be the answer, choice D, zero, minus one, not the answer, so answer is going to be choice C. So when you think the question is complicated, don't freak out, just follow as the question says and go along. Let's go to number 15. Alan drives an average of 100 miles each week. So he goes 100 miles. And his car can travel an average of 25 miles per gallon. And his car goes 25 miles per gallon, which means he's going to need four gallons of gas every single week. And Alan would also like to reduce his weekly expenditure on gas by $5. Assuming the gasoline cost $4 per gallon, which equation can he use to determine how many fewer miles he should travel each week. So he's driving 100 miles every single week and with 25 miles per gallon, he's gonna need four gallons. And if each gallon costs $4, he's gonna end up spending $16. But he wants to reduce this amount by $5 and make it $11 per week. So essentially we are trying to save $5 and we're trying to find out how many miles should he drive less every single week to save $5. Well, if you can figure out how many miles he can drive with $5, then that will essentially tell you how many miles he should drive less each week. For instance, if he can drive 50 miles with $5, then that tells you, okay, he just needs to drive 50 miles less every single week to save $5. So our goal is to find out how many miles he can drive with $5. And to find that, we can use a proportion because we have a linear rate right here. So it tells us that he goes 25 miles per gallon. And for him to travel 100 miles, he just needs four gallon, which is going to be $16. So that tells us, okay, for every $16, he can go 100 miles. And we're trying to find out with $5, how many miles can he go, which is going to be letter M. So essentially this is the equation Alan can use to determine how many miles he should drive less every single week, which is what the question is asking us to find. So let's rearrange some stuff. So the equation looks like one of the choices. We know that 16 and 100 can be simplified, four over 25. And it's gonna look like four over 25 is equal to five over M. And to move M to the other side, we're gonna multiply M on both sides, which will give us four over 25 M is equal to five, which looks like choice D. So D will be our answer. Let's go to number 16. Maria plans to rent a boat. The boat rental costs $60 per hour, so 60H and she will also have to pay for a water safety course that cost $10. And Maria wants to spend no more than $280 for the rental and the course. We want this cost to be less than $280. If the boat rental is only available for a whole number of hours, what's the maximum number of hours that she can rent a boat? Well, let's simplify the inequality here. If you subtract 10, you're gonna get 60H is less than 270, and divide by 10 on both sides, you get 6H is less than 27. So we know that when h is equal to four, you're gonna end up with 24, but when h is equal to five, you're gonna end up with 30, which goes over the 27, which means you can only rent it for four hours. Number 17, what value of p is the solution of the equation above? So let's expand everything. Two p plus two plus eight p minus eight is equal to five p. 
If it's going to give me 10p minus 6 is equal to 5p, subtract 5p, we get 5p is equal to plus 6, positive 6, p is equal to 6 over 5, that will be our answer. Number 18, does system of equations have solution of x and y? What is the value of x? Well, let's just substitute it and find x. 1 half parentheses 2x plus 2x, 4x is equal to 21 over 2. Multiply by 2 on both sides to get rid of the 2, we get that 4x is 21, x is equal to 21 over 4, that will be our answer. Number 19, the expression above is equivalent to this. So we can just set equal to each other, a parentheses x plus 2 squared, where a is a positive constant and x is not equal to minus 2. So what's the value of a? Well, we know the left side is equal to the right side, so we just need to make the left side look like the right side and we'll be able to find out what a is. And on the right side, we only have one fraction, whereas the left side has two fractions. So the left side is 2x plus 6 over parentheses x plus 2 squared minus 2 parentheses x plus 2. So we see that, okay, there's x plus 2, two of them, and there's only one of the x plus 2 right now. So we're going to make the denominators the same by multiplying x plus 2 one more time so that the bottom will become x plus 2 squared, which will make the top equal to minus 2 times x plus 2, which becomes minus 2x minus 4. And because we have the same bottoms now, we can combine the top portions, which would look something like 2x plus 6 minus 2x minus 4 over x plus 2 parentheses squared, which simplifies to 2x minus 2x goes away, 6 minus 4, which is going to be 2 over x plus 2 squared. And we know this is the same as a over x plus 2 square, which means our a is going to be 2. Number 20, intersecting lines R, S, and T are shown below. And what's the value of x, which is right there? Well, we know that, okay, that's going to be 180, which means this angle is going to be just 74. And according to the exterior angle theorem, we know that this angle is the sum of this angle and this angle, which is going to be 74 plus 23, which is 97. So 97 is equal to x, that will be our answer. So that's going to be it. Give it a thumbs up if you found this video helpful, and I'll see you on the next video. What's up, guys? John from Admission Hackers. You just saw one of the fastest ways to solve these SAT questions. And I have created a six-week program that will train you to solve them the exact same way. Everything is in the video format, so it's easier to follow than your SAT prep books. And the program covers only what is proven to be tested on the SAT to not waste your time and raise your score quickly. And I'll be mentoring you personally until you get your target score, but more details in the description box down below. That's it. I'll see you in the next one.